Hi, welcome to this book discussion on changing the subject, feminist and queer politics in neoliberal India by Srila Roy. Srila Roy is a professor of sociology at the University of the Witwatersrand in Johannesburg and 2022 Hans Science Visiting Professor in Sexuality Studies at the University of Sydney. Her long-standing research and teaching expertise is in transnational feminist studies. At WITS, she leads the Governing Intimacies Project, which promotes new scholarship on gender and sexuality in Southern Africa and India, supported by the Andrew W. Mellon Foundation. He, she is a co-editor of the journal Feminist Theory and the recipient of the inaugural FTGS Global South Feminist Scholar Award from the International Studies Association. Her latest books are the co-edited Intimacy and Injury in the Wake of Me Too in India and South Africa, Manchester University Press 2022, and the sole author, Changing the Subject, Feminist and Queer Politics in Neoliberal India, published by Duke University Press 2022. We will be discussing her new book today in this conversation. Well, Professor Roy, welcome to the platform, and I'm so glad to have you here. Uh, thank you so much, Rituparna, and please call me uh, Srila. It's such a delight. I think this platform is such a resource um it's it's you know i dip into the videos now and then i think it's good not just for students but for many of us who are in sociology but are committed to doing interdisciplinary work and i know it's completely run by voluntary uh, labor so thank you to you and your team congratulations Thank you so much. On that note, uh, let me tell you by beginning that I thoroughly enjoyed reading your book and would be very interested to know about your main motivation behind writing the book. Also, if you could lay out the context in which this work emerges. Sure, I'll do that. Um, I'll actually just answer those two questions together, um, if that makes sense. So the context of the book was really laid by widespread feminist arguments or even feelings, you could say, around the co-option of feminist struggles and politics. And that was at least, I think, one of my main motivations behind the research was to try and move away from or at least try and complicate uh, these arguments around uh, feminist co-option and loss. So uh, as I describe in the in the preface to the book, when I first started to think about the questions that would inform the book, I was just ending uh, my stint as a graduate student in the UK. Uh, my PhD was actually on a completely different topic. But at the time, I felt that these arguments or, or these concerns around feminist co-option were pervasive, but they took at least two distinct shapes. So in the global north, they were really expressed as concerns around the institutionalization of feminist struggles in women's studies. So, you know, questions around uh, what is what, what would happen to feminist struggles once they got like a secure home in higher education. I ironically, as I also kind of uh, indicate in the book, at least in the UK, those same women's studies centers were quite precarious. They had quite precarious institutional lives. In the global south, the concerns were quite different. They were about the emergence and uh, kind of the waning dominance of a new organizational form, namely the NGO, the non-governmental organization. So in India, as you probably know, for at least one generation, the 70s, uh, of feminist activists, activism was very much uh, an activity which was non-funded, which was autonomous, which was not linked to political parties. But with liberalization uh, from the 90s and, you know, the coming, the availability of foreign funds, what we see is some of these autonomous women's groups becoming NGOs and we see the rise of, you know, a whole host of new uh, organizations, non-governmental organizations working on uh, gender and sexual rights. And it is within this context that Indian feminists, like many of their counterparts in the global south, start expressing concerns around, well, you know, what, what is happening to the nature of uh, the women's movement, right? What, how is the face of the women's movement changing now that it's being represented uh, more by NGOs rather than by autonomous women's groups? But even then, I mean, it was interesting because I did find a lot of um, empirical documentation of what is actually happening in these spaces. But I did feel that these were kind of partial accounts. You know, I felt like they were a little bit nostalgic about the revolutionary days 
um, gone before and you know when we were like all protesting on the streets and I think it's important to flag as again I say in the preface that I was also part of a cohort who graduated from universities whether in India or overseas some of us went into academia and a lot of us went into the nonprofit sector so it seemed like there was there was kind of I felt like there was kind of uh, more to this story and one final I think important context was uh, the new conversation, the new public conversation around sexuality and sexual rights. So remember, economic liberalization in India coincides with, uh, you know, the global kind of scare around HIV AIDS. India was obviously predicted to be the next like uh, epicenter for the for the HIV AIDS crisis after the African continent, and that very unexpectedly gave rise to a lot of NGOs and CBOs working on sexual rights and allowed sexual subaltern groups like sex workers or men who have sex with men to make claims on the state for the first time. So in, in a nutshell, when it came to this whole new realm around sexuality and sexual rights, these kind of arguments around liberalization, globalization, NGOization were not as, I mean, their consequences were not as straightforward as you know these, these arguments uh, went. So uh, before I, I went into the real, you know, the core research that, con that constitutes the book, I did a pilot study where I talked to kind of a range of um, feminist and queer academics, uh, activists, some working in NGOs across major cities in India. And, and really that was about trying to really get a sense of, again, like I said, what's really happening in these spaces. But just as a final point to say, the book is not a, uh, uh, about really about saying like this is what happens in NGOs. The book actually went beyond that pilot study to look at you know um, distinct forms of queer and and non queer feminist organizing uh, today in West Bengal to make an argument about uh, the several possibilities that we can see in these sites and ultimately to suggest, as I suppose my initial motivation was that there's more to co option in this story. Right. So could you also talk a little bit about your field site, its significance, as well as the methods that you use? Yeah. So um, one of the other motivations of the book was, uh, you know, a more, uh, I, I would say, a more conceptual one, which is, which was to temper accounts of global neoliberalization, uh, basically accounts that tend to think of neoliberalized, uh, neoliberalism as something that's happening everywhere, and, ha and having the same effects. So even if we think of some critical feminist writing, there's a tendency to attribute too much to neoliberalism. Like neoliberalism ends up uh, explaining too much, uh, especially if you think of the rise of a whole you know, host of studies, particularly in the North around uh, the term neoliberal feminism, right? And I was kind of curious about, you know, what does this mean in our context? You know, in, in our, like, the rest of the world. I mean, how does what does neoliberal feminism look like in the context of uh, the global south, where there are comparable but very particular conditions as well? When we think of globalization, or we think of how you know neoliberalism actually doesn't displace but falls into state policies. So, in a nutshell, I was quite interested in situating what we think of as quite contemporary contemporaneous processes informed by globalization, but in much more longer local histories, right? In the specificities of post-colonial uh, India. So the book tries to make the argument and really tries to show that the, the kind of, you know, uh, feminist organizing, if you want to call it self-making, while shaped by, but is not reducible to global neoliberal logics. And so I it tries to kind of trace these more enduring uh, political legacies, which are, which are feminist or statist or leftist, besides, of course, the long history of the Indian women's movement. So repeatedly, the book tries to say, well, you know, yes, this is a story about globalization, but let's actually reorient our gaze towards the local and, and history. So time and, and place, really. And to that extent, I think my ethnographic site of West Bengal was very useful, you know, because I think this is a site that is uh, very amenable to the study of mixed and uh, very varied political lineages for obvious reasons, right? I mean, for 
Uh, those of you who don't know uh, the state of West Bengal has had a very unique history. It had a 34 year long uninterrupted rule of a communist party, one of the longest rules in a democratic context. And even though that ended in 2011, one would say, certainly I would, that a kind of leftist ethos very much in shapes the, the everyday culture of the state and its capital city of Kolkata. And that's actually what I observed, that even in the case of um, you know, organizations and agents operating in these organizations in, in different capacities, whether as volunteers, as activists, as employees, whatever, even though they bore no allegiance to the left or to the le or leftist ideology and had never been a party member, which by the way is rare in a Bengal uh, context because everyone has some kind of you know, affiliation to the party. But even, even though that their personal biographies didn't bear an imprint of the left, you could, I could still observe the endurance of the left in what one thinks of as very, or one could think of as very straightforwardly neoliberal, like microfinance, right? So in, you know, one chapter I show how kind of the, the, the talk around microfinance is still very reminiscent of how, you know, the left would always argue for uh, women's uh, financial empowerment, uh, for instance. Um, in terms of uh, methods, so the book draws on uh, two organizations which are located in West Bengal, a queer feminist organization, which is Orbit, and a, a, a rural uh, organization which works for uh, women's empowerment, um, basically through financial inclusion, so through microfinance, the giving in, uh, the giving of uh, microcredits, loans. Um, the, the queer feminist organization, I thought, was a very unique instance of uh, the generational passage of uh, Indian feminism. So it very much at the start uh, reminded me of these, at least what one had heard of autonomous women's group. You know, it began as a small support group uh, for lesbian and bisexual women. Uh, you know, individuals contributed in a voluntary way. Their meetings were in the evening. And at least in one chapter, I show it's kind of the evolution of the organization into more of a, um, formalized uh, NGO, if you want. The other organization, I think, is was very uh, emblematic of a different trend, right, which is those organizations or those NGOs that came into being after the end of um, the UN Decade for Women, which ends with the Beijing Conference. And actually, locally, quite uh, interestingly, these organizations are sometimes called Beijing Babies. And very characteristically, uh, this organization combines, like I said, uh, microcredit, so the financial inclusion of poor rural women with upholding women's rights. So what I was most became ultimately most interested in was their campaigns around domestic violence and you know child marriage uh, and so on and so forth. So that became much more of my interest and that's what's in the book as opposed to the microfinance program. Um, I used a mixed method approach. Um, with the queer feminist organization, my main method was the interview, which I've done before within my in my previous book. You know, kind of very long, uh, uh, semi-structured interviews combined with a bit of observation. With the second organization, my method was far more ethnographic. I relied re relied much more on observation, and I was uh, quite lucky to be able to have the opportunity to observe them going into. Uh, you know, very classically, the organization would in, uh, would employ uh, community women who they would train and then send out to these field sites in the neighboring rural area. So I would often accompany and do observations, again, combined with uh, interviews. Right. So going into the content of the book, you say that the book is located between being autonomous as well as being co-opted. So could you please explain what this means? Yeah, I think that sounds very abstract. <laughs> and everyone <laughs> listening without without reaching the book, I would be like, what does that mean? Yeah, look, I think it's it's I mean, I, I, I know exactly where I say it because I have what I think is a very nice quotation by a queer feminist activist who says, um, you know, something to the extent that everything ultimately everything um you set something loose and you don't know where it'll end, like everything gets co-opted. And from there I say uh, you know, the book is situated between, so it's it's kind of this sense or this dynamic of being caught and free. And I think what I try and do, even from the preface where I include myself in the narrative is to constantly say, 
Well, at these different scales, if we think of you know, at the scale of the self or at the scale of the organization, we can we can think of we're always within this dynamic of being caught and being free. I mean, in sociological terms, since we are a you know a sociology, you are a sociology platform, and I am like at least uh, uh, on the surface a sociologist. I think it's a classic structure agency dilemma, isn't it? You know, it's about thinking how your in you know your the individual the agent is always kind of informed by by structure and and what does that therefore mean about for agency or freedom right and these are kind of i think our disciplines really big questions and we have like different ways of 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 thinking about that question and in this book you know my my choice was to was to turn to the late foucault uh, foucault's governmentality and care of the self to i think really go back to this this root problem in a way, even though I don't, you know, I don't say it like that, but I think as sociologists, we can, we can discern that that's kind of being caught and being free is kind of that same sort of dynamic and dilemma. But uh, to be more specific, the book is, as I said at the start, trying to find a different way of thinking about uh, feminism's entanglement in power, particularly in a conjuncture shaped by global neoliberalism, uh, outside of these existing arguments around co-option. And I was quite um, drawn to, uh, you know, studies around governmentality because I enabled them, I, I felt that they enabled me to say at least two things, right? One was to suggest very simply that instead of dividing up feminist struggles or practices into ones that are co-opted and ones that are not, ones that are free, you know, I suggest, uh, or I propose rather that, you know, feminism is, is always co-opted. It's not some ever outside of, power, you know, and we have a lot of conceptual and historic, actually empirical arguments uh, to demonstrate that. Uh, but the book theorizes uh, feminism as a governmentality in its own right. So rather than just being informed by external uh, logics and practices and techniques of government, you know, the book thinks of uh, feminism as a, a conduct of conduct in the in the broadest possible sense, you know, as a way of governing both society and selves. So uh, it, to that extent, the book also understands feminism as constituting the conditions for shaping the self, acting as a technology uh, of the self. And it shows at least through the empirical examples, how feminism can afford the tools for, uh, you know, for new ways of, of uh, imagining or embodying the self and, uh, you know, and even you know, enabling kind of new uh, aspirations and new forms of 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 life and livability. And here, I just want to stress that I think this attention to the self that the book is nudging us towards is particularly important in the context of places like India, but again, other comparable uh, global southern places. I mean, people have made this argument for the Caribbean, for instance, where we have not been so attuned to taking the self seriously. You know, as especially. Uh, in terms of uh, political um, transformation, right? Because we, we, we're much more attuned to take seriously the collective, uh, the mass, you know, and, and not so, and, and be a little bit, almost a bit wary of, of the self, right? The individual self. So ultimately, uh, you know, the book argues that as a conduct or, of conduct in the broadest possible sense, and as a technology for remaking the self, feminism is always caught. <laughs> Co-opted, but while also having the capacity to be a transformative uh, force in the in the world, and there also I want to add that you know when I'm looking at these organizations, my again my nudge is towards you know let's try and see what's happening in this unexpected terrain of the self. You know let's not just assess, although the book is not aiming to assess or evaluate organizations, but let's not look at organizational efforts simply in terms of what they're formally trying to achieve in terms of rights, empowerment, but what what are the what else is happening, which is sometimes a little bit behind the scenes, if you want. And and I think that's the kind of, yeah, that that was my interest, and that's that's where the book is trying to direct our gaze towards. So you do talk about West Bengal as your field site. So how does the story of the making of coer feminist government and subjects unfold in that? place and what role does the grammar may you know the village girl play in this yeah 
So, um, Ritupanna, I think that's a really big question. And it's like yeah. a, a little bit hard to answer because I feel like that's the story. That's kind of part of the, the entire story, right? Yes. yes. But um, but I suppose, uh, you know, again, like I, I said at the start that, um, you know, one of the things, and, and I like that you frame the question in terms of the making of queer feminist government and subjects in West Bengal, because one of the things the book is trying to show is that is the importance of place. You know, that uh, again, you know, we could we could look at what's happening on this terrain very much as, uh, you know, NGOs being beholden to transnational forces and therefore, therefore turning to women's rights or therefore using uh, the language of empowerment or, or a host of other things, right? But constantly, I think what I'm trying to do is to say that the factors that shape what I call queer feminist um, governmentality, and I'll, I'll explain that in a second, is uh, not just these global transnational forces, but it's also about the endurance of very high, of highly local uh, structures and ways of knowing and feeling, you know, many of which are a, a direct kind of inheritance of the Indian women's movement. So, uh, you know, the ways in which the organizations think of the grassroots, think of who is the legitimate subject of their political intervention is not, I, I think, that much shaped by what a transnational funder is saying, but by actually the, the ways in which, you know, Indian feminists have historically tried to attribute legitimacy and value to their politics, which were always dismissed if you if one recalls, as being Western or as being bourgeois, right? I mean, that's the kind of classic uh, post-colonial story, which a lot of people, you know, from the Middle East or uh, here in South Africa will recognize, right? It's a story of saying, you know, feminism is something elite, feminism is something Western. It's not, it, it, it's not of relevance. And therefore, our unique kind of burden becomes to constantly push back and say, uh, no, no, actually it is relevant. And it, it, it has some kind of local, uh, uh, importance or balance, right? And the way and the ways of doing that, that those kind of structures of uh, showing legitimacy, of accruing legitimacy value, are the ones that I'm saying kind of endure in the neoliberal moment, but also get kind of complicated, right? So, uh, you know, the neoliberal conjuncture, which has uh, funding and capital, ways of accruing capital, constitutes sometimes a competitive field amongst groups who are trying to you know, compete to get the same small pots of money. So the story of, again, queer feminist government or governmentality is uh, you know, this kind of shifting landscape where now speaking on behalf of the subaltern subject is not only about accruing a kind of local legitimacy, but it's also about actually gaining uh, more, you know, more kind of direct material capital for your, your organized activism or for your interventions, right? I use the term uh, governmentality because it precisely enables me to capture this much more fluid, broad, changing terrain, you know, this ter terrain which is quite uh, complex and which is informed by, again, all these forces operating at different scales, both local, global, both historic, both contemporary, and, and so on and so forth. And again, I think like West Bengal is a is a is a good is is a is a good site to see the kind of messiness of this terrain and to therefore not walk away with quite a simple story about yes the you know the, sh the what's happening now is is again it's all about neoliberalism um in the figure of uh the grameme or the you know the rural woman or basically the subaltern is where i really see the historical and regional entanglements of current uh you know feminist uh, formations so I talk about this figure as a kind of ghostly figure that haunts um, feminists, both queer and not queer. Uh, again, for audiences who don't know, you know, and Mary John, the Indian feminist, is, is the best person to read on this in, in the you know, mid-90s, where Mary John says that the, you know, the Indian women's movement constituted the split subject. So the the main, I mean, at least a particular, a very visible part of the Indian women's movement. I mean, obviously one can't really speak of the Indian women's movement as a whole, but a very visible part of the Indian women's movement were constituted by, as you know, middle class metropolitan, mostly upper caste Indian women, and they spoke on behalf of their kind of, <clears throat> uh, you know, 
poor rural sisters, right? So they spoke on behalf of the subaltern, and she calls this the split identity of uh, the of Indian feminists, right? And what I so so yeah so taking from that, I uh, theorize the the rural uh, subaltern as this kind of ghostly figure who haunts what particularly metropolitan. Uh, middle class, mostly but not only upper caste feminists, even in the contemporary, are uh, trying to the ways in which they try to organize, the ways in which they speak about themselves, and the ways in which they speak and intervene on behalf of others, right? Others who are who might be uh, and everything from rural uh, lesbian women to you know um, low caste, low class women in rural areas who are in need of uh, you know financial inclusion and so on and so forth. And so effectively, I'm saying that, that this kind of, you know, haunting shows the, is a direct legacy of the Indian women's movement and shows how these dynamics very much are still at play, even in organizations, interestingly, that have broken away from the Indian women's movement, like queer organizations, right? Like queer feminist organizations actually experienced, you know, autonomous women's groups of a certain generation as being quite outrightly homophobic. But what I find is in the figure of the Gramimi or the ways in which they speak about their interventions as being on behalf of the grassroots or on behalf of the subordinate, I find the endurance of these kind of, uh, you know, far more normative assumptions around what Indian, uh, uh, Indian feminist politics ought to look like and on whose behalf it ought to speak, right? Um, and in 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 both uh, in both cases, in the cases of both organizations, and but this is a more general point. I say this kind of postcolonial haunting produces defensiveness. So it produces a way of saying, of of constantly operating in the field as saying, well, I'm authentic and you're not, right? And and actually in the in the chapter on the queer feminist organization, I end by saying how trans feminist organizations, which were much more emergent on the scene than I ended. Uh, my research, but now are you know much more visible, but how they get mired in the same normative structures, right? So there's this. So in a sense, it doesn't matter who the organizations are, but it's kind of that we're locked in this logic of producing authenticity, whether for forms of legitimacy, whether for forms of you know actual material gain, like getting you know, vital sustenance that you need for your. Um, organizing for your activism to endure but for whatever the reason might be the same logics uh, logics persist and therefore we don't have the possibility of encountering the ghosts of the past in a in a different way and that's kind of you know the I mean I, or I, I would say the book offers that in in a different way right but yeah I, I mean I hope that makes sense I know it's kind of a big question and <laughs> I'm not I haven't done justice to it no, I think you did very well. And uh, readers, actually listeners will get a chance of what the book is about and they can find out more when they read it. So um, I also want to know a little bit about how queerness itself as a way of life exists in millennial Kolkata. And, you know, how is intersectionality limited and enacted in that process? Sure. Um, so as you know, Rituparna, this is the... Um subject of chapter four so the subject of chapter four is is or is really about yeah uh, you know queer queer lives in 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 calcutta today but uh, i think it's important to flag the broader context of that chapter and the broader context of the chapter is kind of the unprecedented uh queer activism and visibility that uh, happened at a time that you know i was doing my research because the indian courts uh, decriminalized, recriminalized, and of course, eventually uh, decriminalized homosexuality. But uh, at the time, it was just the D and the recriminalization. But even though, uh, you know, homosexuality was still criminalized, what we saw, and we all, you know, know this, was this huge kind of opening, at least in urban India, right? We had um, uh, a lot more uh, visible uh, queer, you know, individuals, communities in urban India, we had the market really embracing uh, queer identity. So I start the chapter with the Anouk advert for ethnic apparel, which features, you know, a lesbian couple. And it's very striking how, you know, the lesbian couple is kind of 
uh, waiting for their parents to arrive. So it shows that, you know, they're kind of out or they're going to come out to their parents. But I also start uh, the chapter with the advert because the advert gets, and there's of course been a lot of other writing about that, but not just, uh, I'm certainly not the first, which make the point how, you know, the advert is immediately about um, sexuality and queer coming out of the closet, but into the comforts of a very recognizable cosmopolitan middle classness, right? And that's kind of marked by the interior, the interior setting of the advert, which is very much, uh, you know, uh, cosmopolitan, global, like there's a MacBook, uh, there's a poster of Clockwork Orange, but there's an antique wooden table. And of course, it's ethnic wear, which is handloom and cotton. So I, I open with the advert because the advert immediately, uh, you know, flags this, this kind of idea around a limited inter intersectionality, which I, I discussed through the chapter, right? Which is how this moment of opening affords these unprecedented you know, possibilities around uh, queer livability, queer visibility. But at the same time, you know, there's 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 something happening about uh, about the stability or or the restabilization of caste and class norms in in which makes it a very specifically Indian story, right? And again, of course, I am I am not the only one to make this argument. You know, we have lots of uh, uh, queer theorists, feminist writers who are all making these arguments, and much more so, I think, now after the decriminalization, right? How in a way, uh, what's happening in India as elsewhere is you know the the disruption of sexual and gender norms but the stabilization of caste and class ones. But uh, in the chapter, uh, I engage the narratives of uh, young queer and trans folk who uh, were some of the first to come out of uh, the closet. And uh, I describe you know, their stories of whether, of being, I mean, a range of stories, right? For a range of narratives from being queer at home to ones of trans exile, to having a closeted caste identity and of also coming out as both a radically queer and respectably left, again, in ways that you know show how the story is really about making or sustaining Bhadralok, respectable middle-class Bengali identity, uh, which is very specific to that context and would not be as recognizable to people outside of that context. Um, so ultimately the book, the chapter, sorry, suggests that you know, who chose to came, come out of the closet and under what conditions reveals quite sharply intersectional uh, questions, right? And even within a community that seemed on the face of it as being relatively homogenous in terms of, you know, everyone being English, English speaking, everyone having certain amounts of privilege in terms of language, location, caste, class, all queers were not the same. You know, and actually what some uh, rallied against it as being, you know, uh, far too normative emerged as the crux of aspiration or uh, inclusion for others who felt more ambivalently um, included, right? And uh, all of these, I think, kind of dynamics make for what I call after uh, Pavan Singh a limited and not a robust intersectionality, right? So. Uh, as I said, the you know the, the chapter is really in conversation with a lot of queer theorizing today in India, especially that which shows how caste might have the greatest potential to expose um, the intersections and even the exclusions of uh, more kind more privileged ways of you know queer life making in in urban India at least. Right, so. Of course, we have to talk about NGOs. Uh, they play a crucial role in your book. So how do they become a site of feminist self-making in these neoliberal times? Yeah. Um. So, yeah, so that's also just to remind um, everyone who's, anyone who's listening and hasn't read the book is that, you know, I, I treat NGOs as sites of what I called uh, queer feminist governmentality, but also as sites of self-making. And... Again, you know, the, the, I mean, I think that's more interesting to think of them maybe in terms of the latter, because we have already a lot of studies which think of, you know, NGOs as forms of extensions of, uh, of status government, right? Like, I mean, that's kind of, you think of governmentality studies and, you know, people like Akhil Gupta and James Ferguson's work. I mean, that's really what they're using governmentality to theorize, right? They're using governmentality to think of how non-state agents take on state uh, rules. And 
an NGO is a classic example. So when I first started thinking about the book and reading some of the literature, I mean, I was interested in that, but I thought it was quite limiting, right? And that's why I actually, I think of, you know, governmentality and self-making, and that's why the book is helpful as two sides of the same coin, almost to suggest that, you know, if you're thinking of these sites as sites of governmentality in their own right, you can't not think of them in terms of the possibilities of making the self, and even more so because then here's the kind of neoliberal twist, as opposed to the tail, it's because the ultimately, you know, what makes these, what is the product that these organizations are, I don't want to use, I mean, not selling, but you know, what's actually the service, a lot of it is work on the self, right? So unlike the state or organizations of a previous generation, which would do welfare, or which, um, you know, would, uh, would, would give you a kind of a service or a handout, more and more, the what the organizations are doing is in the realm of transforming the self, right? Through forms of consciousness raising, through forms of what they call inward or outward um, empowerment, through counseling, advocacy, uh, training. I mean, a, a lot of the, so I, 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 you know, in one chapter, I look at gender trainings, right? And a lot of that is about, in that chapter, it's uh, training to uh, a rural, poor rural women. And it's all about, well, empowering the self. So in a sense, these were the perfect site to look at uh, feminist self-making because the organizations were most fundamentally defined by this activity of you know, uh, making the self through distinct forms of labor on the self, right? I mean, that's kind of uh, really, really the work that, they, that they're doing, right? And, and, and of course, it's through the language of empowerment, it's through the language of women's rights or sexual rights. So in one, in one sense, it's sort of like, how could you not take these seriously as, as feminist self-making? I mean, I did a talk last year where someone said, why are you even considering NGOs when you talk about feminist struggles? Like, what have NGOs got to do with feminist struggles? And of course, I, you know, on the one hand, you have to remind people that, you know, these organizations are the face of the local women's movement. And they also really embedded in, uh, you know, national networks, maybe even international networks. I mean, when there is a march against, you know, the state, these are the people who show up. I mean, but, but even if that was not the case, the fact is that, of course, you, I think you have to take them seriously as sites of, of feminist self-making because they do so much everyday work, which is directed at the self, right? As I said, through all these, like, distinct um, uh, practices. So um, in this, this, this call to change the self, whether that was through uh, consciousness raising, gender training, uh, uh, peer education, NGOs, uh, or at least the ones I observed, nourished rich projects of uh, self-making. And I, mean, I think one has to be careful to say that these were not in terms of, you know, one can't map a direct causal connection. It was more like they created an atmosphere in which one could really, I, I mean, for a lot of the rural women I spoke to, it was for the first time they had really thought of the self. And I say that a lot in the penultimate chapter, right? It was the first time in this milieu that they could really think of an I, like what you know, what do I want? Who am I? And that was a that was a direct consequence of being exposed to, you know, workshops where they were encouraged to think about, well, who am I beyond my family? You know, who am I? Uh, beyond my community or my caste and so on and so forth. So I so so this constituted a whole atmosphere of you know of engaging in kind of different experiments and becoming different people. So everything from sartorial choices to you know thinking about your marriage differently or to you know taking uh, uh, participating in new kind of uh, aesthetic norms, embodied norms, and of course and obviously you know this kind of these kind of practices were not only engagement with uh, gender and sexuality, but also, of course, with uh, caste and class. I mean, the other thing I want to say here is that the book doesn't posit self-making as this site of agency. You know, it doesn't just say, oh, actually, the flip side uh, to governmentality, i.e. governmentality bad, self-making good. No, I think I, I try to complicate uh, the terrain of self-making by saying, uh, so again, for instance, in the case of the rural women, to say how, you know, some of the self-making could be read as quite conventionally uh, neoliberal, not feminist. So, you know, relying, for instance, on a kind of makeover, like I style myself in a particular way so I can attract a man. And certainly actually diverting from the far more feminist 
uh, aspirations and discourses of the NGO, you know. So, so this is not to say that self-making will have immediately kind of progressive political uh, consequences and outcomes. And I think we should be careful of like not again reinventing that wheel. You know, the I mean, if if structure and agency is kind of uh, sociology's problem, then power resistance is is feminist theorizing's problem. You know, you're constantly saying, where's the scope for resistance? Where's resistance happening? And I'm not trying to say that self-making is the terrain for agency or for resistance, not at all. You know, it's a complicated terrain where some norms are upheld, some norms are discarded. And I'm obviously much more curious about, you know, uh, about why, like, you know, why is it important uh, for rural women to assert consumption practices, right? I mean, why why is it for them? I mean, when empowerment for the NGO means financial inclusion, for the rural women, sometimes it means uh, having access to a, a, a you know to a pair of jeans and riding a cycle, right? So I'm quite I'm interested in 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 what you know in what that signifies for them and what that means for these places which are undergoing quite rapid transformations, whether that's in terms of urbanization, uh, globalization, and so on and so forth. And ultimately, like to restate, I think what I said before, it's also again to take the scale of the self seriously, right? It's to say, uh, well. You know, I mean, even if it's not obviously a sufficient condition for social transformation, surely, surely, you know, the self has some role to play, like self transformation, you know, has has some kind of role to play in wider social transformation. And if I just, you know, go back to um, Foucault for a second, I mean, I remember being very struck by this interview where uh, he says that, you know, looking at um, I, mean, I forget the actual uh, words, but basically, in a nutshell, he says like the real thing about struggles for homosexual rights, uh, for rights for you know, yeah, equal rights, sexual rights or whatever, is uh, is not about um, formal equality. It's about the art of existence, and I was very struck by that, you know. And that's, I think, the kind of uh, background overarching motivation of the book. It's like, what if we stop thinking of you know, even the terrain of movements or NGOs or organizing, not just in terms of these formal claims towards equality empowerment, but how they in inform this whole art of existence, right? And and obviously, again, I, I, I'm saying this mindfully because once again, we're in a context or in a moment where it's very easy to say, oh, care of the self is neoliberal. You know, care of the self, or talking about the self is again, like everything today has become so uh, facilely about the self and and the self is all about the market. But, you know, my plea is to think, well, it, yes, but, you know, maybe again, maybe there's there's more to it. And if we really think of this terrain as a robust terrain of making this making selves and, and selves being made, then, you know, what, what can it suggest? Well, last question. Uh, you use the term millennial feminism in your book. And I think this is something that would interest our young readers specifically or yes. listeners as well. So could yes. you please explain the context in which you use it and how it is connected to neoliberalism in India? Yeah. So I I mean, just not to disappoint people too much, but the book actually doesn't, uh, I mean, it doesn't sort of talk, I mean, I know where you mean, I say it at the, in the introduction, but I don't, you know, I don't talk about uh, millennium fe millennial feminism throughout the book. And, and that's also because I use it in a very specific uh, way. I mean, it's actually what it says on the tin. It's really about kind of new forms of activism that emerged from the turn of the of the new millennium, right? So late 90s, early 2000s. And we all know, you know, that was a moment in which we saw some very unexpected, uh, unexpected or more like new forms of uh, feminist organizing, right? So we saw internet campaigns, you know, asking uh, women to send pink underwear to a right-wing group. We saw uh, campaigns that were inciting at least urban uh, middle-class women to take to the streets, to sleep outside, to loiter, and so on and so forth. And of course, we had the Delhi protest, which is kind of where, you know, my book begins, which was this enormous uh, uh, catalytic event and that no one expected to kind of travel and reach in the way it did, again, largely because of digital technologies. So I use millennial feminism to really gesture to this newness. Oh, Me Too is a, you know, India's Me Too is another moment, right, of, of showing how 
they these kind of protest actions and actors were using technologies which were quite different from uh, you know what we had come to uh, associate with the established Indian women's movement, which was much more pacha and demonstration, you know, and and again, as I said before, which was much more on behalf of uh, subaltern sisters. Whereas here we actually see, uh, you know, urban women and you know uh, more and more uh, queer communities speaking much more on behalf of themselves, right? They're not actually mobilizing on behalf of someone else. They think, well, I want to be in the streets, you know, I want to occupy the streets, or or even with the the Delhi rape, I think one of the things that surprised audiences was how much, how many men, you know, middle class women, middle class men as well took to the streets uh, to protest, right? So so I use I use the term to, yeah, to I mean mark this temporal moment. But of course this temporal moment is directly enabled by the conditions of India's economic liberalization. And to that extent, you can say what I'm referring to as millennial feminism is also neoliberal, one could say, kind of neoliberal feminism, because it's enabled by forms of a digitalization, it's enabled by forms of urbanization, you know, it's, it's, and in fact, there have been some people like uh, Himangini Gupta, for instance, has written an article really talking directly about these campaigns as forms of neoliberal feminism in the ways in which she thinks that they, uh, again, like they center the self. And, you know, that was, again, one of the things I feel like the book is in conversation to and trying to move away from is this, cons is this easy way of saying, well, actually, if something centers the self, then it's, it's neoliberal feminism. And that's kind of bad, as opposed to like, good feminism, which is about the collective. But, uh, but having said that, I mean, even though I said at the start, you know, the book doesn't, I mean, for people who don't know, the book doesn't engage with these campaigns. Like it's not a book about the pink chattis and the blank noises, but it does try and I think suggest that, you know, what the organizing I'm looking at, um, whether it's a, a box standard NGO doing microfinance or queer feminist uh, uh, activism, that can be included in what we think of as millennial feminism, right? And it can, it can be included and it can expand our imagination of uh, who is a millennial feminist, you know, and, 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 and what does that mean and what practices that produces, you know, at the scale of both the self and the social. Right. So thank you so much. It was wonderful listening to you. And I'm sure that all our young as well as not so young readers and listeners will benefit from listening to this conversation. So once again, thank you so much for navigating time zones and doing this. Oh, thank you so much for having me, Rituparna. It's, it's, a, it's a pleasure and an honor. And I, I'm looking forward to seeing all the new yeah. videos you have lined up for us this year. Yeah, thank you so much.